to the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today I've got my work cut out for me, because I'm finally looking at Zombieland Double Tap, released 10 years after the original in 2019. The first Zombieland is a horror comedy classic that came upon the crest of zombie mania in American pop culture. It notably featured an all-star cast of Woody Harrelson and a bunch of young actors who would quickly go on to enjoy massive critical fame. This sequel brings them back, reuniting all four of the principal stars with writers Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, this time joined by David Callahan, and director Ruben Fleischer, who was just coming off directing Venom. I actually got to do a cool monster truck event for this movie and speak to the writers alongside Chelsea last January. It was one of the few events we got to do in 2020 before Rona shut everything down. Zombieland Double Tap, which takes its subtitle from a term that the original did not invent, sorry for implying it did, is a a pretty late arriving sequel. Plans for a second Zombieland actually began before the first film was even released, but for a long time, the main actors involved just weren't sold on a script. They and the filmmakers went on to do other big things. Co-writers Reese and Wernick, for example, wrote Deadpool and its sequel, until things finally fell into place for Double Tap to start filming in January 2019, once again in Atlanta, Georgia. If the original came at a time when zombies were still fresh, the sequel was released long after they had re-died. The most recent zombie craze had a long, agonizing death, but I think its end was punctuated when Andrew Lincoln left The Walking Dead. Coming one year after that, Double Tap feels like an unnecessary sequel. Not a bad movie by any means, but there's not a lot here that feels groundbreaking. That is, other than the amount of kills I'm gonna have to count. Dear God, I have been dreading this moment. Because in case you forgot, in the original Zombieland kill count, I counted all the zombie deaths. A rule I made before I saw this sequel. If only you knew, Past James. If only you knew. Zombie kills can get awfully bloody, but with a sponsor for this episode, I can leave the carnage uncut. Manscaped has a plethora of personal hygiene products that'll keep you from being mistaken for a nasty undead zombie. You wouldn't want to get Bill murrayed, you know? One of my favorite Manscaped tools is their Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. Cause the older you get, the more unseemly that stuff can be. And I ain't getting any younger. With a 9000 RPM motor and a 360 degree rotary dual blade system, the Weed Whacker will clean up your face holes while preventing any nicks or snags. That's because it uses the same skin safe technology used by the lawnmower body hair trimmer. You can get the Weed Whacker by itself, or as part of the performance package, for 20% off and free shipping by going to manscaped.com slash deadmeat. That's 20% off and free shipping to all sorts of places by going to manscaped.com slash deadmeat. I've got a hell of a job ahead of me, but the time for complaining has passed. It's time to nut up and count up. The movie begins. Wait, there are two kills before the movie even begins? Oh, fuck, does that not bode well. Once again, Columbus starts the film off with narration, welcoming us back to Zombieland and flexing his meta by showing he knows he's in a movie. We have a lot of choices when it comes to zombie entertainment, and we appreciate you picking us. After 10 years of living in Zombieland, our heroes know their undead foes so well, they've named the different types. There are dumb dumb homers, who serve more as entertainment and target practice than actual threats. Speedy Smarty Hawkins, who can use bodies they find on the ground to solve puzzles and get themselves additional kills. Clever girl. Hey, that's my reference. And finally, the so-called ninja zombie, who, much like a smelly fart, is silent but deadly. Let's re-meet our Oscar-worthy cast, y'all. Jesse Eisenberg as Columbus, Woody Harrelson as Tallahassee, Abigail Breslin as Little Rock, and Emma Stone as Wichita. Friggin' Master of Puppets brings in our title card, because Zombieland knows how to use Metallica, with the original's opening montage set to For Whom the Bell Tolls. Director Ruben Fleischer wanted Master of Puppets back then, but couldn't afford the rights. Looks like this sequel got the big bucks. The song plays as the characters kill 21 zombies in a slow motion opening credit sequence shot at a whopping 450 frames per second. That allowed the actors to do everything at a normal speed while still getting this wonderfully fluid slow-mo. And I know that slow motion and Metallica seems like a far too obvious way to make something seem badass, but Zombieland is aware of how ridiculous it is, so I think it works. Besides, how can you not love Woody Harrelson's face 
right now. The crew decides to move into the White House, cause fuck it, might as well be president of Zombieland, right? As a history nerd, I love the scenes of them hanging out on Pennsylvania Avenue, living among American artifacts, and exchanging Christmas gifts wrapped in taft. Who's our fattest president? Also the only one to become a Supreme Court Justice. Chief Justice, in fact. Tallahassee's gift to Little Rock is the Colt 45 Elvis gave to Nixon. A real-life thing that actually happened. Tally thinks it's rad, cause he loves the king, but Little Rock has been bristling beneath his overbearing, patronizing ways. Meanwhile, Columbus and Wichita have been living in sin in the Lincoln bedroom. And when Columbus tries to propose to her, with a friggin' Hope Diamond as a ring, she doesn't exactly jump up and down screaming Yes. Married people only do one thing. What, fight? We, we already do that. Get divorced. The proposal freaks out Wichita so much that the next morning, Columbus wakes up to find that the ladies have fled the capital, driving away in the Beast, the presidential limo that Tallahassee's been outfitting with armor and a minigun. You are so gorgeous. The decision of the sisters to flee harkens back to their flightiness in the first movie. Never get attached, remember? And also gets them out and about so we can meet our first new zombie Land character, the hippy dippy Berkeley. Namaste, girl! A month later, Columbus is still mopey while Tallahassee's ready to hit the road again. There are only so many local zombies to kill with the titular double tap. If you liked how the first movie gave out its own golden chainsaw, good news! They're still at it, giving zombie kill of the week to an excitable Iowan farmer. You dead zombie! To their credit, it is a great kill, full of blood and laughter and tying everything up in a nice package at the end. Tallahassee says he wants to roam because he has Blackfoot Native American heritage. A clumsy plot device, in my opinion, that only serves to set up that kill count nightmare of an ending. And they hunted those buffalo by herding them off the cliff to their dens. While perusing scented candles, Columbus runs into and nearly kills a woman named Madison. You thought I was a zombie? Yeah, of course a zombie. Oh my god, no, I don't even eat meat. I'm a vegetarian. Vegan, actually. She's been hiding in a pinkberry freezer and is very happy to see another human being in person. Maddie is played by Zoe Deutsch in a film-stealing performance. Though she's not a fan of Tallahassee's brusque sarcasm, she hits it off with Columbus, with whom she shares an earnestness and excitedness, though she trails him in survival prep. You have a list of rules for surviving Zombieland? Actually, mine is just mostly stay in the freezer. He takes her back to the White House and shows her the Lincoln bedroom, where she pounces on this Ohioan in the bed of a Kentuckian. Not an Illinoisan, cause Honest Abe was a carpetbagger. Maybe that's why he now has to share his room with Obama and friggin' Borat. And bear witness to all this sexy time. Very nice. Their emancipation penetration might make for good cardio, but it probably feels more like a Seward's folly when Wichita shows up suddenly and without warning. She's here to grab some weapons because Little Rock is gone, fled from her sister with Berkeley and the Beast. The two of them are headed to Elvis's home of great Land now, with a big bag of weed fit for the king. The activism evoking name of Little Rock's runaway boyfriend is enough on its own to incense Tallahassee, but then he hears that he's also a pacifist, and that sends him into an explosive rage. No, I really, I have nothing against uh, pacifists, I just... Wanna beat the shit out of him. The three make plans for a temporary team up to get Little Rock back safe and sound. Columbus and Wichita are just starting to repair their relationship when the newbie shows up and complicates things. You coming back to bed? Damn, Columbo. Already forgot about those pink berries you were picking? The next day, they all set out in the only vehicle available, a teal and brown Pontiac Transport, the sight of which causes more cartoonish rage from the minivan hating Tallahassee. Wish he would tone it down a smidge there. Madison tries to make friends with Wichita, but a wall of jealous frustration prevents any communication outside of snide remarks. You guys are all very sarcastic. Yeah, they're not nice people. Sorry about that, Madison. Just try to ignore Northern. Tallahassee finds an RV to replace the minivan with, but the alarm goes off and summons a horde of zombies, meaning it's time for me to put my counting cap on. 26 zombies, one for every goddamn letter of the alphabet, get killed as Columbus calls out locations of threats for Tallahassee and Wichita to gun down. Columbus also occasionally puts some Zeds down for himself, and at one point Madison helps Wichita score a kill. Thank you. 
You're welcome. It's a fun sequence, and like many in this movie, combines humor from the characters being themselves with exciting action as they take care of the undead enemies looking to feast on their flesh. The last zombie killed in this parade of carnage is a hawking that runs at Columbus only to be shot mid-air as he flies off the bus. Good kill, that one. A ninja zombie bites at Madison's foot until Columbus kills it by shooting it in the head. But then a final foe shows up that isn't put down by Tally's bullets. This is an all-new strain of zombie, a so-called T-800 whose resilience to being double-tapped earns its terminating moniker. Tallahassee unloads his weapons, but it's not enough to put the Zed down. He's not completely stopped until his head gets squished. Thank you, Manscaped. The new RV is bested by a They Might Be Giants live album, so the crew is forced to continue on in the minivan. While chatting, Madison comes up with the idea of ride-sharing apps, something these people would have never known about since their society ended in 2009. The others make fun of her since the idea sounds crazy and dangerous, and during the exchange, Emma Stone legit laughs at Zoe Deutsch's performance. Like, if they try to murder you, they'll like, you get zero points, but if they don't try to murder you, okay. you'll be like, you get, five, you get four, five points. <laughs> I noticed that character break the first time I watched this, and the behind the scenes stuff confirmed my suspicions. Zoe Deutsch, Ew. just spectacular and very funny to a level that's a bit problematic because we're having having a hard time shooting the scenes and not completely cracking up and having to redo them again. Unfortunately, all of a sudden, Madison's not feeling good. And if that puking's any indication, it's about to be zombie o'clock. The four lead actors had script approval, which is pretty rare, and even more unusual is that Woody Harrelson had puke approval. For Madison's upchuck, he demanded something thick and chunky, so makeup and effects artist Tony Gardner made a batch of vomit using vanilla pudding, almond milk, and granola chunks. Not sure what would taste better, that or the zombie mouth goo Gardner's team made, consisting of chocolate syrup and coffee grounds. I've mentioned Tony Gardner a lot on this channel, since he worked on Bones, Hellfest, and of course, Seed of Chucky, where he also played himself. For Double Tap, he designed the silicone zombie prosthetics in a way to make the undead seem more weathered and aged than they did 10 years prior. Hope the makeup was comfortable, cause that's Tony's daughter Kira having the effects applied to her right there. Kira Gardner is actually a filmmaker herself and is currently working on a child's play documentary. I might just make a small appearance in it. With Madison's fate seemingly sealed, there's only one thing left for her new friends to do. If you love something, you shoot it in the face. Columbus catches up to her in the woods, and with her looking worse by the minute, he apologizes before firing his gun off screen. Now lacking the film's funniest character, they continue their trip to Graceland, which absolutely elates Tallahassee. Every choice I've ever made in my life has been leading me to this moment right here. But then they find Graceland in complete and utter shambles, and that leaves Tally all shook up. Wichita is too, since Little Rock isn't here, but they quickly find a replacement Graceland. Replaceland? A little place called the Hound Dog Hotel. With the beast parked out front, maybe they finally track down Little Rock. Inside, the hotel looks like the real life Graceland, complete with exhibits like Elvis's actual shoes. I can understand the excitement of seeing those. For Christmas, Chelsea got me a pair of David Bowie's actual shoes that he wore in the Let's Dance music video. That gets her off the hook for Christmas gifts for like a decade. Tallahassee takes a moment to tickle the king's ivory but he's assaulted by a woman, played by Rosario Dawson, sticking a gun in his face. Hi, my name's Tallahassee. Nevada. Whoa, 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 I'm sorry, what did you say? Nevada. Yeah, that's what I thought you said, which means you're clearly not from Nevada. Come on! Everyone meets, and Nevada tells Tally he's lucky she didn't murray him. You know, when you shoot someone because you think they're a zombie? Apparently that's how Bill Murray died. She also says Little Rock, left with Berkeley days ago, headed to a place called Babylon, an apparent safe haven. Babylon is filled with Gen Zers and Beto O'Rourke's because no guns allowed is this place's one rule. That and no group six. The guns are melted down in the shadow of Babylon's tower, which sits in the middle of this enormous, colorful, and quite frankly thriving community. Look at that rooftop courtyard. At the Hound Dog Hotel, Tallahassee and Nevada bond over a deep love of Elvis Aaron Presley and brown liquor. The two of them sleep together, and in the morning, while Tallahassee's giving an encore performance, 
performance, they hear the sound of twisted metal. It's the beast being run over by a giant honking monster truck. My apologies, Tiny Elvis. Just didn't expect anything to be parked in my driveway. It's time for our final new characters. Luke Wilson as Albuquerque and Thomas Middleditch as Flagstaff, who serve as mirror images of Tallahassee and Columbus, down to Flag having his own list of Zombieland guidelines. Expect the unexpected. It's actually one of my commandments. These doppelganger characters were originally offered to Ryan Reynolds and Michael Sarah, but I like Wilson and Middleditch in the roles. Both of them, Middleditch especially, do a great job mimicking the actors opposite them while still seeming like their own person. This is great, having two of you. I think so. Also, their names are a bit of an inside joke. Albuquerque and Flagstaff were the original names for Tallahassee and Columbus, before they decided to use East Coast cities to match the Georgia-based production. Some zombies have followed the Southwest Bizarro Boys here, so the two of them go to show how they kill the brainless undead in this apocalyptic idiocracy. They fight and kill the three T-800s while the others watch through the window, but we don't get to see the ultimate kills on screen. During their celebration slash debriefing, Nevada notices a bite on Kirky's arm, and after some more yellow puking, man, it's so gross. We've got ourselves a couple more T-800s. The fight scene that follows is a masterpiece of choreography and camera work that took a day and a half to film, which makes sense given that it goes on for way longer than you'd expect. How are you doing? Bad! How are you? Bad! The two minutes of non-stop action is filmed to look like an unbroken take, although there are about seven hidden cuts during which the actors would swap out with stunt performers. They're done seamlessly though, and the sequence is a highlight of the film. It finally ends when the doppelgangers are killed, Kirky by a head bash with a guitar, and Flagstaff by a gunshot to the dome. Those guys are dicks. Good kills, but not zombie kill of the year. That award went to a dude in Pisa, Italy, who lured a trio of zombies towards a womanikin and her kittikins before leaning the famous tower right on over to crush them to death. Vaffanculo! Though there's obvious chemistry between Tallahassee and Nevada, they decide not to bring her along right now. Maybe she had to go help Cory campaign. Since Tallahassee can't get a hang of the monster truck, they're forced to use the minivan once again. They shortly catch up with an ice cream truck on the road, and look who's driving that freezer on wheels. Why the hell is she still alive? Oh my God, I Yep, lucky for all of us, Madison is back. She says her earlier state was caused by a nut allergy after eating trail mix, and Columbus, out of kindness, shot his gun over her head. I was really just trying to scare you off. You're not gonna get rid of me that easy. Oh no. <laughs> the quartet makes it to Babylon, and though Tallahassee's reluctant to abandon his Second Amendment rights since it'll allow him to see Little Rock, he reluctantly complies. Production designer Martin Whist had a fun time making Babylon, a hipster hippie utopia with aesthetics based on Burning Man. That meant a lot of scavenged materials and original artwork. It's a great location for the film to have, especially for use in this final act. The group finds Little Rock and wraps her up in a big ol' hug, but she's not exactly thrilled to see them here. These people are peaceful and they're friendly and nice and Honestly, I don't think you're gonna fit in here. I love how much of this movie calls out that the main characters are kinda shitty. Tallahassee actually approves of Little Rock's new safety, so he decides it's time to head out on his own like the lone wolf he thinks he is. Everyone takes it hard, especially Madison. I will never forget you, what's his name? See you, pals. It's Tallahassee, I told you that. Sally Dally! <laughs> That's another instance of the cast laughing at Deutsch's performance. I noticed it as an editor because they cut away halfway through her line. Sally Dally! <laughs> It was once again confirmed by Blu-ray specials, this time the blooper reel. What's your name? It's Tallahassee, I told you that. Sally Dally! <laughs> Sally Dally! Isn't that a good Sally Dally! Oh my God. I love how much Emma Stone appreciates Deutsch's comedy. So it was <laughs> impossible for all of us. Yeah. So funny. She's so funny. Yeah. But everybody's so funny is yeah. a great thing. I mean, it's like. But just... especially Zoe. As soon as he starts his solo run, though, Tallahassee comes across an army of T 800s running towards a fireworks show at Babylon. He quickly heads back to alert them of the threat, which is gonna be tough to deal with considering they melted down all the weapons. Look how we made these cool little peace things. 
Berkeley exposes his uselessness, so Little Rock breaks up with him and makes amends with Tallahassee, who takes charge of the community to plan out their defense. They outnumber us a hundred times, but they ain't got what we do. Guns? We don't have guns. What? They do have biodiesel, though, which the original foursome uses to lay a trap for the zombies, and also a trap to break my kill counting spirit. With the lighting of more fireworks, they lure the horde towards their walls, then light the fuse to a biodiesel bomb that lays inside a fence of flames to keep the zombies back. The zombies accumulate into an uncountable number, especially with the quality of those flame effects in the long shots, and then are all blown to bits by the bomb. This is the first of three occasions where I just didn't know what to do. First, I tried asking the writers themselves. It's like so, maybe a thousand? I don't know, tough to say. But I wanted to ask how many extras he had on set just to give me some kind of number to work with. It was a lot a, of those lot, were, were visual effects. Then I tried talking to my buddy MatPat about the software he used when he counted up the kills in Mulan. But those were dark figures against a white background, which allowed AI to detect them. This is just dark zombies in a dark scene fucking exploding. AI can't handle that. So I took things into my own hands. I counted 50 zombies in the clearest and most well-lit shot, but after that, the pen continues to fill for another 12 seconds before the bomb blows up. Since it took 19 seconds to get from when the first zombies crossed the barricade to when I counted 50 inside the pen, I'll just assume there was a rate of 50 zombies per 19 seconds. That means 12 more seconds would give us an additional 32 zombies, rounding up, resulting in a total sum of 82 zombies blown up with the biodiesel bomb. But, like I said, that was only the first of three headaches for me. Because plenty of Zeds didn't get blown up, and countless more surround the platform upon which the main characters stand. Though they fight back, these are T-800s, so I don't think any stabs or bludgeons would count as kills. In fact, things look so bad, they embrace each other in a Toy Story 3 style group death hug. And that's when Nevada shows up in the monster truck. Here we have hassle number two. It's easy enough to count a single zombie being crushed, but after the others get into the truck and Nevada starts Tokyo drifting, it becomes another all-out splatter fest. I leaned on editor Josh for this counting session, and he and his girlfriend painstakingly track 139 zombies getting run over, pulled under the monster truck tires, sideswiped, destroyed in a gore twister, and otherwise murdered by Nevada's big rig road rage. Also, using a monster truck to kill zombies is an idea that was around from the very first draft of Zombieland 2, according to Reese and Wernick. I can see why. They end up tipping over the monster truck and gain access to the tower after various things are dropped upon the zombies in their way. I'm glad Madison and Berkeley get to have a hero moment as they continue to kill more zombies who give chase into the tower, giving us 13 total to add to the count. Inside the stairwell, I think two zombies are killed by Nevada and Tallahassee as they run up to the roof. Donkey Kong, motherfuckers! Finally, Babylon is able to enact their ultimate plan, Tallahassee leading the zombies on a zombie run off the tower's edge. Once again, Josh and his lady helped me count here, and we saw 70 zombies running off the ledge while Tallahassee heroically dangles from a crane. Man, why did I think counting zombies was a good idea? I probably won't do it again when I get to train to Busan. Oh, and the reason I'm counting 72 deaths here is because there are a couple of Coda kills. Two walkers who almost get Sally Tally until he's saved by Little Rock with the Elvis gun she snuck inside. They rescue Tallahassee, everybody exchanges hugs, and Wichita finally says yes to Columbus's proposal. Kiss on me, Land or not, we're meant to be together. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, everybody kiss. I said everybody kiss! Get to it, newbies! There's one last kill to throw onto the pile, too. A homer who wanders off the edge on his own. Go! Oh! The movie ends with celebratory fireworks, 420 legalize it! And the new family driving off into the sunset in Elvis's pink Cadillac. Then there's a mid credit scene taking place on day zero of the zombie problem, during which Bill Murray was doing a press junket for Garfield 3, Flabby Tabby. Why in the world Garfield 3? Drugs cost money. I love that they got a bunch of real TV personalities for this scene, and that Bill Murray didn't have any scripted lines. 
He just ad-libbed everything. While taking a selfie with Bill, Al Roker starts puking up yellow stuff and turns into a zombie before getting knocked out by Bill with a chair. Murray leaves the interview and goes on a zombie-beaten rampage that was filmed in just 90 minutes using three cameras at once. It's an impressive showcase of Bill Murray's physical comedy. The 68-year-old is doing all of this himself, with no stunt performers or stand-ins. I don't think any of his chair hitting or plate smashing would count as kills, but we do see Lily Estefan as a zombie. Since we saw her alive earlier during the interviews, I'll go ahead and count her as our final kill of the episode. Thank God. I hate Mondays. How many zombies were tapped until they wound up on the kill count? I mean, I can't tell you for certain, but I'll give you a bullshit estimate. Let's go! Oh, uh, oh, shit. Uh, these won't stop. Someone help! By my best estimate, there were 376 kills in Zombieland Double Tap. That beats the record of 292 set by Final Destination 532 days ago. Ladies and gentlemen, your winner and new Kill Count Champion, Zombieland Double Tap! Congratulations. With a runtime of 99 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 15.8 seconds. What the fuck, man? I'll give the Golden Chainsaw for coolest kill to the first T-800 of the film. After nearly four years of kill counting, I can safely say a head being crushed is one of my favorite kinds of kills. Doll Machete for Lamest Kill will go to the three T-800s killed off screen by Flagstaff and Albuquerque. And that's it! Zombieland Double Tap came out in 2019, and though it set the record, was not the most difficult movie I've ever had to count. I did give up during Wreck 3, after all. Until next time, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Dan, Katie, and Samara York, Connor Leingruber, David Meadows, Dane Holthouse, Hugh Corcoran, and Alex Dunkley. Not sure exactly when the next Kill Count will be, but at the very least, there will be a Valentine's Day one. Just go with the flow, dude. It's January. Work on your resolutions, you know? I am. I'm fucking working out every day. Thanks, everyone. Be good people.